Behind you, you'll see a photo of me. There it is. Picking apples with my family in the days before calories counted. Now, fast forward to today, and I'm currently completing my final year in the nutrition and food program here at Ryerson University. Now, I wish I could just blend those two words together, nutrition and food, as if they were synonymous and reinforcing, but I can't. Notice I said nutrition and food. Nutrition first, then food. This order is symbolic of a pedagogical hierarchy with nutrition taking the lead. For my talk today, I'd like to pose the question of what it would be like to put food first. I ask this because I see food in its preparation as an integral part of our history. If we are what we eat, then to speak about food is to speak of identity. Food is cultural, food social. It's personal and it provides us with all sorts of metaphors for how to live life to the fullest and how to eat, drink, and be merry. Now, nutrition has always unconsciously been incorporated into our interactions with food. You know, if you eat an apple, you're going to absorb some vitamin C, whether you recognize this or not. However, our conscious appreciation of nutrition is a somewhat new idea. Now, if we consider food historically, we'll note a shift in the role of women from that of nurturer to nutritionist. For example, we see women's nurturing qualities before the 18th century, when women and food were praised for their healing powers in the use of medical cookery. So, you know, Household herbs, spices, and other food items were thought of as powerful remedies for both acute and chronic disease. And women were the bearers of this knowledge. Now, the next major milestone was that of home economics. Now, home economics embraced women's nurturing qualities, but also professionalized their roles in the world of food, cooking, cleanliness, clothing, and child rearing. Originally, home ec was thought of as a social mission both to improve the health of society and to provide women with equal opportunities with respect to men. So, on the good side, home economics allowed women to enter the university. But on the bad side, once admitted to the university, the outward social mission of home economics was lost, and the focus of the curriculum came to be reduced to a concern with, you know, you and yours. Now, reacting against these limitations, women turned to science to re-legitimize themselves as food professionals. This is where nutrition, as an official discipline, based on the scientific principles, started to emerge in the university curriculum. Now, today, most nutrition and food programs tend to be situated in the sciences, and female nutrition professionals have become very protective over their scientific affiliations. This is likely in response to cultural changes in education that have placed greater value on the abstract knowledge of science as opposed to the experiential knowledge of practice. Because of this, nutrition has tried to amplify its legitimacy, emphasizing its abstract scientific dimensions, reducing foods to mere nutrients, numbers, calories, and portions. Famous scholar Georgi Skrinis would describe this paradigm as nutritionism, or the assumption that scientifically identifying nutrients in foods determine the value of these foods. Now, because nutrients, numbers, and calories are, are constructs that the layperson cannot see or, or really even understand, the role of the nutritionist is heightened and further legitimized. As a result, the layperson becomes much more dependent on the nutritionist's abstract knowledge in helping them to navigate the grocery store. Now, this is not to say that nutritional science is bad for the public. Absolutely not. You know, nutrition research has brought forth numerous advances in health science that have led to the disappearance of nutritional deficiencies like Rickert's or scurvy. But an absence of disease does not necessarily equal the presence of health. Health is a holistic construct, and nutrition is only one part. What about the social, cultural, emotional, traditional, and sensual dimensions of food. Let's experience some of these facets of food through the journey of this apple. You can close your eyes if you'd like, or just follow along. You're seven years old. Your parents pile you and your siblings into the SUV and crank up the Rod Stewart. 
omit if you hate Rod Stewart. You drive two hours out of the city on a beautiful Sunday October morning. It's cold out, but your mom made sure you wore a hat, a scarf, and a cardigan under your jacket. Your parents pull over for a Tim Hortons double-double, and you get a Canadian maple donut. Food is cultural. You drive past the pumpkin patch before pulling into the grass parking lot of the apple orchard. A fresh-faced adolescent directs you and your family to the farthest row of trees, and you each accept a bag. Your father he lifts you into the air, and you reach with open arms. It feels like you're just two short branches away from touching the clouds. You embrace your first apple and bring it to your mouth. Stretching your jaw wide and biting down hard, you laugh as the juice escapes down your chin. Food is sensual. Your mom finishes the pick picking duties as you enjoy your snack. And together, your family fills three large bags of fresh local product. You pile back into the car and make your way to your grandmother's house for a holiday feast. Food is traditional. You arrive with bags of Granny Smith, Macintosh, and Empire. And just note the evocative nostalgia summoned by these names. After hours and hours of planning hide-and-go-seek with your cousins, you're called to the kitchen by the smell of crisp turkey skin and warm apple pie. You sit next to your eldest cousin and listen diligently to his, to his adventures away at summer camp. You watch him respond to his hefty appetite with a second helping, and you do your best to impress him with yours. Food is social. You finish your turkey, your potatoes, and you even manage to choke back a few green beans. Mom says you did good and you're entitled to dessert. Your grandmother places a generous slice of warm apple pie on your plate and kisses your head. You can see her watch your expression out of the corner of her eyes. You take your first bite. You make an approving groan, and she smiles, confident you've accepted her offering of love. Food is emotional. Now open your eyes. Now, did anyone keep tallying on how many grams of fat was in that apple pie? And what percentage of your daily recommended allowance of vitamin C did that apple provide? OK. So perhaps the better question would be, does a focus and arguably an obsession with food's nutritional components neutralize our passion and experience for that food. It's like, did we eat that apple pie because our body was begging for a dose of antioxidants? Or did we eat it because our grandmother made it with love? Or it was the holiday? Or maybe you were just hungry for something beyond micro and macronutrients. Sometimes I worry that we may be confusing a hungry soul for a hungry body, or a body of knowledge that displaces all the social, cultural, and experiential dimensions of food that we just experience together. My other concern is that such an obsession over food's nutritional components creates conditions that make messages about food very misleading, decontextualizing, contradictory. Even nutrition professionals are unsure which knowledge and language to trust, increasing the difficulty of the layperson to make informed, healthy eating decisions. You know, you've, you've probably heard it all. Oil makes you fat, olive oil makes you healthy. Al alcohol causes heart failure, red wine's good for your heart. If, if someone were to actually go out and abide by each of these latest nutritional fetishes, they would have to clear out and restock their pantry on a daily basis. My concern is that, you know, such complication and contradiction overwhelms some members of the public to the point where they reach this information saturation point where they can no longer stomach the complication of eating well. Let's just take yogurt as an example. Now, the yogurt aisle seems to be getting bigger and bigger every day and is bursting with nutritional promises. More omega-3, sugar-free, probiotic, prebiotic, more fiber. <laughs> you practically need a nutritionist in your shopping cart to help you decode all the scientific jargon you read on packages. And now, I'm not suggesting that 
any of these nutritional innovations are a bad thing. You know, it might be good for you to choose a yogurt with a bit more fiber if you're gonna eat yogurt anyway. The problem is, is that we tend to latch on to these reductionist marketing statements and respond with extremist behavior. It's like when we're told low fat is good, then we assume no fat is better. But, but that's not necessarily the case. Mary and Nestle summarize this predicament best, suggesting that the problem with nutrient by nutrient analysis is that it takes the nutrient out of the context of the food, the food out of the context of the diet, and the diet out of the context of the lifestyle. For this reason, it's my belief that our current nutrition-based messages like cut 500 calories here or half a cup of pasta as a serving, they're not really working. And that's probably because we don't eat numbers. We eat food. And as Michael Pollan argues, a food's value is more than the sum of its parts. And you know, it seems to me that current nutritional sciences are potentially in danger of disregarding one of the foundations of home economics, that food is nurturance. For this reason, it's my belief that rather than looking back at our home economics roots with disdain, that we need to embrace some of its teachings and principles. This might mean rethinking the nutrition and food curriculum with a greater emphasis on cooking, culture, family, and society. And, and now I'm not advocating for an either or approach to nutrition and food, but rather greater integration of food within the nutrition discipline. And, you know, it would seem to me that the time for this is right. You see, over the past few years, we've seen an explosion of food media personalities, from Bobby Flay to Rachel Ray to Jamie Oliver to Nigella Lawson. There are box office hits about Julia Child, and there are mock Iron Chef competitions in nearly every metropolitan city. Something has captivated people. It might be the way that Rachel dives into her plate of linguine with such anticipation, or, or maybe it's the way that Nigella sneaks down to the kitchen at midnight for a guilt-free nibble of cheesecake. Perhaps it's that look in Jamie's eyes when he picks that really ripe heirloom tomato. Or maybe you just think Bobby Flay's cute. Whatever the attraction, people are demonstrating a keen interest in food. And nutrition professionals need to use this as a vessel for healthy eating messages. So as a nutrition and food student with a hankering for new knowledge, I think it's time to develop a new form of food pedagogy, one that seeks to embody the sensuality of food knowledge its presentation, its consumption, and its sheer enjoyment. And it's my belief that this holistic approach to food would lead to much greater social health outcomes. So when it comes to healthy eating, don't put all your eggs in just one reductionist basket. Remember that an apple a day, not 300 milligrams of vitamin C, keeps the doctor away and find the time to slow down and appreciate food, glorious food. Thank you very much.